Now, I believe that the Lord's given um, me a word today um, as part of your uh, series that you've been in, Cultivating a Spiritual Flow, uh, and that there is something from the word here that's going to help us navigate that and continue in that end, and it's from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the ESV. Uh, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Amen. So you've been in a series called Cultivating a Spiritual Flow. I believe that this passage has a lot to say about what it looks like to cultivate a spiritual flow. In fact, I would argue that knowing and walking in God's good, acceptable, and perfect will is walking in accordance with his flow. Amen. Walking in his good acceptable and perfect will is walking in his flow. So how do we go with the flow? How do we go with the flow? That's the question this morning. Turn to somebody and say this morning, go with the flow. Go with the flow. How do we get to know and walk in God's good, acceptable, and perfect flow? Well, there are three things I want to bring out from this, this passage this morning, that if we want to go with the flow, we need dedication, transformation, and proper evaluation. Dedication, transformation, and proper evaluation. So let's look at dedication here. Dedication. Romans 12.1, uh, look at what it said one more time. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In this passage, there are four qualities of dedication that I wanna bring out. First, dedication is willful. It's willful. Look, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. To present. When we trust in Jesus Christ by faith, we're born again. We're in Christ, we're adopted into God's family, amen? amen. That's our objective status, sons and daughters of God. But every single day, we have to decide that we are going to live in accordance with who we are. We are sons and daughters of God, but every day, we have to decide to live in accordance with that reality. That's a willful decision that we have to make. We have to, in the morning, when we wake up, sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes five times after that person cuts you off on the highway, you know what I'm talking about. You have to say, Lord, I'm yours today. I'm presenting myself to you today. I belong to you today. It's willful. But it's not just willful like out of nowhere. It's also responsive. Notice the text says therefore, right? It says therefore, because of what I already said, by the mercies of God, other translations might say in view of God's mercy, right? Therefore, by the mercies of God. What is this? This is a reference to look back to what he's already said in the whole letter. Making adjustments. <laughs> it's a look back to what he's already said in the whole letter. Especially what he said in chapters 9 through 11. In chapters 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul uses the word mercy 10 times, which is more times in those chapters than any other use of that word in any of his letters combined. Take any other time he writes, anything else he says, he says, he uses the word mercy more times in those chapters than anywhere else. Why? Well, in, in chapters 9 through 11, he's, he's talking about God's sovereignty, and God's sovereignty is most beautifully expressed in how he decided to pour out his mercy on us and save us. It's beautiful. 
And what Paul is saying is in response to the reality that God saved you by his mercy, offer your bodies. Respond. So it's willful. It's something we have to choose to do continually. But it's not just willful. It's a love response. It's a response that says, God, I love you. I love you because you so loved me. You sent your only son to die for me so that I could live. What else can I do but give my life over to you today, right now, in this moment? It's responsive. It's also holistic. It's meant to encompass our entire being, our entire lives. Notice he says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This, this, this part here leans on some imagery that comes from um, the Old Testament, specifically from the book of Leviticus. There are some major sacrifices offered in that book, but um, the only sacrifice where the entire animal was laid on the altar and then burnt in its entirety, so it was completely consumed, was the burnt offering. All the other sacrifices, a portion was given to the priests or to the people to eat. This one the people brought and brought the entire animal. It was killed and in its entirety put on the altar because the entire animal represented the entire person offering the animal. And when this animal was completely consumed, the smoke came out of, uh, came off the altar and went before God. And often in the scriptures it says it rose up as a sweet, savory aroma to the Lord, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. What was pleasing to the Lord about it? God loved the smoke, not because he likes good barbecue. God loved the smoke because the smoke came from the burnt offering, and the burnt offering was an expression of someone's complete dedication to the Lord. So, So when he says, offer your bodies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, he's saying to us, the way we should approach every moment of the day, every day, Lord, my entire life belongs to you. Everything I do in this physical world, it's yours. I lay it all down before you. And it's not just one time. See, those animals, they were killed. They were killed. They were placed on the altar dead. And when they were burnt, they were gone. And yeah, we've died with Christ, but we've also been raised to newness of life with him. Amen? And so our sacrifice is not a dead one. It's a living one because we're alive in the body of Christ. Amen? So it's every day as a living being, as a living member of the body, I lay myself down and say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. Holistic, my entire life. And notice it's also worshipful. He says, which is your spiritual worship? You know, I love worship music. Anyone love worship music? Anybody in this place? Right? The worship this morning was amazing. Praise God. We can give God glory for that again. Go ahead. Give God glory for that again. Sometimes what we do is we associate the word worship with music. But worship, now music is wonderful. It's a beautiful expression of worship. But worship is deeper. What makes what we did this morning worship is not the rhythms. What makes it worship is the heart posture. It's a heart posture of worship. That's worship. Worship is here. Worship is this heart posture. That's why he can say to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's worship. When you're in your car and you choose to use all your fingers to wave instead of just one, that's choosing something above your flesh, isn't it? That's worship. God, I'm gonna lay my whoo, I'm laying my flesh down. Those choices, it's all worship. Sometimes that worship is expressed in song, and that's beautiful. But don't think for a second that once the singing stops, worship should stop. This is your spiritual act of worship. See, what happens when we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, when we actually do that, and we, we lay ourselves, so to speak, upon that altar every single day in, in, in that entirety, that action, it 
itself goes up like smoke before the Lord and because we have Christ's righteousness and his holiness he sees that as a holy and acceptable sacrifice that he rejoices over and that's worship that's worship that's worship now I'm convinced this is this is the part right because we're trying to talk dedication transformation proper evaluation if Satan can cut this part off right here he cut off the other stuff too This is the part where he'll try to cut us off. Right here, in this dedication section. How many of y'all used to get in trouble for having dirty bedrooms when you were a kid? Come on. Come on. How many of y'all still getting in trouble for having dirty bedrooms with your spouse? Come on. All right. So what would happen if mom said, you better clean your room. I'm coming in there in 10 minutes. Right? All right. So if you were like me, when mom said that, you obviously did the best you, you could at cleaning, which equates to opening the closet door and shoving everything in the closet. Come on, somebody. I'm not, I'm not encouraging being deceptive, but come on. We can be honest in the house of God this morning, amen? We shove everything in the closet, right? And, and, and the room looks clean. We pray mom, mom doesn't open the door. <laughs> But the room looks clean. It appears to be clean, but it's not as clean as it appears to be. Why? Because we didn't get rid of the mess. We just hit it. And so some of us are living with spiritual bedrooms that look clean, but our closets are full of idols. We took all of our idols and we shove them all in the closet and we close the door. We want everyone to see how clean we look. But we don't deal with the mess. The mess is still there. And and check this out. See, here's the thing. How many of you know that just because you shove the stuff in the closet doesn't mean it goes away? And also, when you open that closet, it's all ready to come out. And so not only are those idols shoved in the closet, they're waiting for us to open the door again. And that's what we do. Every time we open up the computer and go on that website, we got no business going on. When we open that incognito page, when we go into those DMs, we have no business being in. We're just opening that door, worshiping those idols. The enemy wants us to live lives of Partial dedication. Because partial dedication will always be lives where the world, the flesh, and the devil have the power of manipulation. Partial dedication will always lead to your manipulation. The flesh will get you. The world will get you. The devil will get you. So he wants us to shove everything in the closet. God here says, no, 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 no. Here's what you need to do with your idols. Smash them on the ground, throw them in the trash, put them out in the curb, and let them go to the landfill where they belong. That's right. Hallelujah. Satan wants to cut that off. So don't give Satan something that belongs to God in totality. Yes, you want to cultivate a spiritual flow, you've got to be all in. Yes, and that is a willful responsive, holistic, worshipful, daily decision for all of us to make. Spiritual cultivation takes daily dedication. If you write things down, you take notes, write that down. Spiritual cultivation takes daily dedication. Turn to someone next to you and say, go with the flow. If you want to go with the flow, then it takes daily dedication. Next part here of what what we read, transformation. So we have dedication and transformation. First part of verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Here we have two commands, a do not and a do. See, when we live lives of dedication and we live lives of surrender, you had a message last week, right, that said, I will surrender to you, right? That was was all about surrender. If we're going to live lives 
of, of dedication and surrender, there are going to be some things we need to cut out of our life and some things we need to add to our life. And so it says here, do not be conformed to this world. To be conformed here carries the, the picture of being impressed according to a certain pattern. So uh, basically the best image of that is like cookie cutters. When you're going to bake some cookies, you get it all laid out and you use a cookie cutter. That cookie cutter creates a shape. And once that thing is finished cooking, you have that shape. This is saying, do not let the world shape you. Do not be molded to the shape of the world. In the words of this series, do not fall into the world's flow. Do not fall into the world's flow. What is the world's flow? Well, it's a flow that is dedicated to its own idols. It's a flow that is dedicated to its own worldview. It's a flow that celebrates what hurts us. It's a flow that normalizes sin. It's a flow that makes excuses for bad behavior. It's a flow that focuses us on ourselves to the exclusion of the other. And if you've been paying attention to the way the world works, it's a flow that out of the one side of the mouth yells love and out of the other side of the mouth yells hate at the same time, depending on who you are. That's the world's flow. Don't fall into the world's flow. But instead, notice the but there, in contrast, in contrast to, to flowing with the world's flow, in, in contrast to being conformed to the patterns of this world, be transformed. How many of you want to be transformed? Be transformed. But that transformation is not going to happen by accident. It's intentional. You can't just like lay on the couch and be like, God, transform me. And then just keep eating chips. Look, you're going to get transformed if you keep doing that. It's not going to be the way you want to. It, it's, it can't be lazy. It's got to be intentional. Transformation is intentional. These are commands here. Commands are meant to be followed as acts of the will. We have to intentionally move on this. We have to say to the world, no, and we have to say yes to Jesus. No to the world, yes to Jesus. Of course we do that when we get saved. We understand that. that that's what we're doing. We come to Jesus Christ by faith, and maybe today is your day to do that. Maybe today is the day where, for the first time, you've been coming, maybe you've been coming to church a bunch, or maybe this is your first time here, but maybe today is the day where you truly lay all those things aside and accept Jesus Christ by faith. There is a transition that happens there. There's a transformation that happens there. You go from being an object of God's wrath to being an object of his delight through faith in Christ. There's a transformation that happens there. But every single day, we have to choose to walk in accordance with that, to continue to be transformed. It's not something that stops this transformation here gets us in God's flow. It's an intentional choice to say, God, I want to be changed today so I can flow with you. Amen. So, how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we live a lifestyle of transformation? How do we do that? Well, the text tells us the method for that intentionality is right here in the passage. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You want to be transformed, you get transformed by the renewal of your mind. As a believer in Jesus, your mind daily has to be renewed. So how do we keep our minds renewed continually, daily? There are three keys here I want to, I want to talk about with this. And I, I've got to give props to one of our youth students for this because um, instead of saying goodbye Whenever he would leave a place or when somebody would leave a place, he switched it up and he had like a speech he would give. And he would always say, stay, stay safe, stay in scripture, stay in prayer, stay accountable. And as I was preparing for this message, I'm like, man, he should have just came up here and preached next to me. <laughs> but I want to look at that because those, those three, 
right? At the end there, stay in scripture, stay in prayer, stay accountable. These are keys to being renewed in our mind. Stay in scripture. If we want to be in God's flow, we need to be in God's word, right? The word of God renews our minds. It's, it's where we learn God's will. It's where we learn God's way. The Holy Spirit illuminates the word, which, which means he makes it clear to us. He, he illuminates the word not only for information, but also for application. And we need to be in that word every single day. Parents in the room, you've ever left a note for your kids, right? You ever leave a note for your kids and, and you put it on the counter you know, and, and you leave, and then you come home, and, and you're like, all right, little Jimmy, did you do what I asked you to do? And little Jimmy says, oh, dad, I, I didn't know how to do it. And you say, didn't you read what I wrote? No, I just figured you would tell me. Some of us want to hear God just speak, but we don't want to see what he already spoke. Amen. We want to hear God tell us something he's already made clear in his word. We got to be in his Word. Open that Bible. Get a reading plan. Re-listen to the previous Sunday's message. Find a biblical podcast. Do anything you can to get the word in front of you every day. That's how you'll be renewed in your mind. Amen. Stay in prayer. Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13. He says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Let prayer be such a common feature of your life that it is odd for you not to be talking with God. That's what prayer is. And it's the most basic level. It's talking with God. Now, that's going to take different forms in, in, in different times, depending on what the prayer need is or what the moment calls for. But when we talk to God, what we're doing is we're realigning ourselves we're realigning ourselves in accordance with who he is and with his will. And in prayer, what you find is something amazing. The Holy Spirit speaks in prayer. He both convicts and confirms. He both corrects and directs. He both refines and reminds. Come on, somebody, raise your hand if you notice that the Holy Spirit has that work in your heart, right? He has that work in your heart, in your life. When you come to God in prayer, the Holy Spirit will speak. And guess what? It's always in accordance with God's word, what he already said. So you get to know the word, you, you stay in prayer, and you stay accountable. Next key feature, keep yourself, stay accountable. Keep yourself around others who keep you in God's flow. You need, we need to be around people who love us enough to keep us in God's flow. I don't like the mountains. I'm not a mountain guy. I don't, I don't like that. It's not my thing. Somebody's shocked, right? <laughs> Shocking, right? It's especially crazy when I'm driving. And like everything's cool. We're driving, we're driving. And all of a sudden the scenery opens up and I'm like a, a million feet off the ground. And there's no guardrails. Anyone ever drive like that? You get somewhere there's no guardrails and you're like, I don't know what these people are thinking. <laughs> you know, sometimes what happens is we see guardrails as barriers for where we want to be. Instead, we should be seeing them as barriers keeping us from where we shouldn't be. Oh. Yeah. And we need people who are going to act like guardrails for us. That's not judgment. It's encouragement. We need to get rid of yes men. Stop surrounding yourself with yes men. I looked up the definition of a yes man. This is the definition, Webster Dictionary definition. A person who agrees with everything that is said, especially one who endorses or supports without criticism every opinion or proposal of an associate or a superior. Look, it might feel good to have some yes men around because we don't like to be challenged, right? But listen, I'm going to tell you something right here. Forgive me if this is too, too forward. I know I'm a guest in the house today. Forgive me if this is too forward right here. Not every idea is a good idea. Not every impulse is an unction from God. 
Not, not every impression is a word from God. We, we need to be around people who can hold us accountable, not just give us a parachute to let our descent into darkness be more comfortable. That's what yes men do. Yes men, just give us a parachute, make it real comfortable to go into our darkness. Yes men will keep you conformed to the patterns of this world. Yes men will offer, what will help you offer your bodies as living sacrifices to your idols. Yes men will lead you by the hand into situations that feed your flesh instead of situations that feed your spirit. And here's the thing, the difference between a yes man, uh, a yes man and an encourager is this. A yes man will help you fall into whatever flow you want. An encourager will help you go with God's flow. So stay accountable. Get a group of brothers and sisters. Get a mentor. Serve in the church. Be around God's people here. You've got some amazing people you can be around here. Pursue godly relationships. Stay in scripture. Stay in prayer. Stay accountable. These are some ways we intentionally pursue transformation by the renewal of our minds. Spiritual cultivation takes intentional transformation. Spiritual cultivation takes intentional transformation. Turn to someone and say, go with the flow. If you want to go with God's flow, you need transformation. Now, from dedication and transformation comes proper evaluation. Proper, I use that word proper because we're always evaluating things. We're always checking things out and seeing where we need to go. We need proper evaluation. Look what it says in the second part of verse two here. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, there are three words here used to describe the will of God. Good, acceptable, perfect. Good speaks to moral rightness. Acceptable speaks to that which God loves. And perfect speaks to completeness. It's very important. Perfect used this way. This word for perfect uh, means completeness. And in this case, it's the completeness of purpose. It's like, it's like, Actually, not only moral rightness, not only what God loves, but actually that which accomplishes God's purpose completely. We all want to know what God's will is. Raise your hand if you want to know what God's will is. We all want to know that. We all want to know what God wants. We all want to know how to live in a way that accomplishes his purpose for us, but we have to discern that. You have to discern that. You have to test that. You have to evaluate the things that are in front of you so you can come to a determination that you're in accordance with God's will. It takes discernment. You gotta look at the things that are in front of you. You gotta look at the questions that you have. You gotta look at all of those things. It takes proper evaluation. And that proper evaluation can only come when we are being transformed. Proper evaluation only comes when transformation happens. Look at the word that here, that. It introduces what's called a result clause here. A result clause uh, is basically a fancy way of saying, if you want this, do that. <laughs> do this, then this, right? It's a result. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that. So that, or then, you will be able to discern. By testing, you can discern what is the will of God. So how does transformation enable proper evaluation? Well, by staying in scripture, staying in prayer, and staying accountable, we take away or expose lenses that are coloring the way we see things. Let me... Let me illustrate this. Honey, would you mind um, bringing up these, these flowers here? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nice. Look at that. We did not plan that, y'all. 
All right. What color are these flowers? They're yellow. Good. Not a trick question. They're yellow. Imagine these flowers, the, the yellowness of the flowers. This is God's good, acceptable, perfect will. Well, what would happen if I put on red sunglasses? What color would I see? I'd see orange. You know what happens sometimes? We can be in a field of yellow flowers and we have no idea because our lenses won't let us see what's already there. See, I have these yellow flowers, right? They're easy to see, but they're easy to see because I have clear vision. If we can't see, sometimes we can't see what God's will is. Sometimes we can't see where he wants us to go. Sometimes we can't see those things, not because it's not there, but because how we see things is impacting what we see. And this impacts relationships too, because I could be here with my, with my red sunglasses on, talking about how wonderful these orange flowers are, and then you, brother, you, you could have your blue sunglasses on, and if you have blue sunglasses on, what color are these flowers? Green. They're green. So now me and you are arguing over whether or not we're looking at orange or green flowers, and we're both wrong because our lenses need to be taken away, yes. right? And so if we have God's word and God's words telling us that these flowers are yellow and we're in prayer and the Holy Spirit's confirming that these flowers are yellow and we're in accountability and the people around us, more mature brothers and sisters in the faith are pointing to these flowers and saying, brother, you're looking at yellow flowers right now. Then we have the insight to know that these are yellow flowers and that either my lenses need to be taken off or if I can't take my lenses off right now, if I don't know how to do that, if I don't know how to go through the work of removing my lenses, at least I can acknowledge that they're there. So when I see something orange, I can know it's really yellow. See, proper evaluation flows from intentional transformation. When we stay in scripture, stay in prayer, and stay accountable, we get the insight to be able to discern these things clearly. Proper evaluation comes when we can admit that the way we look at things is colored by our lenses. What you're seeing right now might be colored by your insecurity. God might have something for you you haven't walked into yet because you don't think you can. And that's not how he wants you to see that. that those are glasses you put on. Those are glasses that come from trauma in your past. Those are glasses that come from that time in middle school where you didn't have any friends and you thought no one would like you and you thought you had to impress people in order to get what you needed to get. That lens you're still wearing right now and so God's presented you with this new job that you won't walk into because you don't think you're worthy of it. But the flowers are still yellow. Your fear could be coloring how you view what God has before you. You're staying where you are, not because God's telling you to, but because you're too afraid to step out of the boat. Why? Where does that fear come from? Well, wherever it comes from, you're still wearing the glasses. It's not just those things either, y'all. It's our pride. Our pride gets in the way. Some of us are prideful people. Right now, you're sitting down, you're like, not me. That is one of the most prideful things you can say. <laughs> Sometimes our pride is coloring the way we view things. Sometimes God wants us to lay things down that we don't want to let go of. Our pride keeps our hands on things. God says, no, release. See, we have lenses. Whatever those lenses are, it takes, here you go, honey. Whatever those lenses are, thank you. It takes transformation to remove them. I'd like to... Uh, Invite the worship team, come on up. Just want to kind of pull all this together here. Spiritual cultivation takes proper evaluation. If we're going to walk in God's good, acceptable, and perfect will, we got to be able to discern what that is. If we're going to go with his flow, 
we need to be able to discern what his flow looks like. Amen? Turn to someone and say, go with the flow. If you want to go with his flow, it takes proper evaluation. If we're going to walk according to the will of God and cultivate a spiritual flow, we need proper evaluation, which is enabled by intentional transformation, which happens in the context of daily dedication. Dedication, transformation, and proper evaluation. So here's what it all comes down to here. Here's what I want us to have on our minds as we begin to bring this to a close. A life of dedication, transformation, and proper evaluation is a life of spiritual cultivation. This is how we go with the flow. Now, it's easy to say, praise the Lord, right? Amen. Good word. Leave. That's it. Some of us are guilty of that. I myself am guilty of that. But you came in here today not just to drink a spoonful of something. You came in today to get a drink that you can keep with you for the week, right? Sometimes what we need to do to receive what God has for us is to let go of what we arrived with. And and so in just a moment, I'm going to ask us to be bold. Just a moment. It's going to take some boldness. There are some areas of all of our lives. I know this because it's true about me. There are areas of all of our lives which are not completely dedicated to the Lord. There are idols we have in our closets. There are areas in our lives where we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Maybe the enemy's tried to trick you. Maybe the enemy has told you that you can't change. How many of you ever heard that I can't change? This is just the way I am. That's a lie. That is a lie. If God says that you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind, whose voice should you listen to? All the voices of all those people who probably don't even know what your name is now anyway, or him who's created you in his image and his likeness, who love you so much that he sent his son to die for you, knows every hair on your head, every cell in your body, knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows more about you than anyone else. And if he says you can be transformed, you can be transformed. So maybe you come in here with something that you believe you, you can't change, you can't be released from, you can't get freedom from. You, 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 you've let go of the, the, the hope for that miracle. I'm going to ask us to lay it down at the altar. What is robbing you of your dedication? Lay it down at the altar. What's robbing you of your transformation? Lay it down at the altar. What's getting in your way? What are the excuses that we make that we can't be in the word every day? Well, when we clock more hours in Instagram than we do in the word, we have time for the word. What do you bring in with you? What are your lenses? Maybe there are lenses that you have that you need to lay at the altar. Take the glasses off so you can see rightly. So I'm gonna call up the ushers to to come on up. I'm going to ask us to stand with me. Would you stand with me, please? And if I spoke to you, if there's something that you need to lay down today, then would you be bold? And would you begin to to just simply arrive? You know, I'm I'm a firm believer in this. Yeah, praise God. I'm a firm believer in this that even the decision to step forward is breaking the chains that bound us this morning. That yes, the prayer is amazing. Yes, we need that prayer. We need that time. We need that ministry. Praise God. We need that ministry. Glory to God. But even the act of coming forward is breaking chains. 
know, we sing a song at our church where, where, where there's this, uh, I don't know, I think it's a fill or something. I'm not a musician, so I'm not sure what, what it's called, tag or something like that. And it's just let the chains hit the ground up all over this place. Let the chains hit the ground all over this place. See this? Look at this. Praise God. This is chains breaking here. So you want to cultivate a spiritual flow. Daily dedication. Intentional transformation. Proper evaluation. That's what's happening in this moment right now. So in just a moment, I'm going to just lead us in in prayer. And there are ushers here who's going to pray. We're just going to linger, spend time in prayer. Here we have some folks who will come and and, and pray with you as well. And just let let the Holy Spirit minister to you the Holy Spirit minister to you. Father, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you call us to a life of daily dedication, and that is worship to you, Father. That as, as, as we lay our bodies down today, as we, are, as we bring ourselves, our whole bodies to your altar today, the smoke of that offering is rising to you right now in worship. Thank you, God, that you're receiving this as worship right now. That the hearts here who are laid before you, this is a worshipful posture. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, God, that there is transformation that is happening here. Thank you, God, that we were in your word. Thank you, God, that they are before you in prayer. Thank you, God, that there are people around them right now. Father, thank you that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I pray, Father, that in the name of Jesus, the lies that have been embraced about identity would disappear. The lies that have been embraced about purpose would disappear. The lies that have been embraced about what people are capable of or what rooms they could walk in, those lies would crumble at your feet. Those idols wouldn't be placed back into any closets. They'd be kicked out to the curb where they go. I pray, Father,